Soil testing is an essential tool for farm management, providing you with information about soil nutrient levels and other soil characteristics that can affect farm productivity, plant and animal health. Of course, collecting an accurate soil sample is required for useful interpretation or comparisons. How you collect soil samples may differ depending on the reason for testing the soil, so it's important to design your soil sampling strategy to suit your purpose. The key thing to do when sampling is to make sure that the sample you collect and send for analysis is representative of your test area. In this video, we'll outline soil sampling for predictive, diagnostic and monitoring purposes. Predictive sampling is used to inform management decisions such as liming or fertiliser application rates. Soil is assessed for deficiencies, toxicities and other impediments to plant and animal performance. Diagnostic sampling is a targeted approach to discover the cause of a problem, so specific areas are a focus. For example, an area with lower than expected yield or signs of crop stress. Monitoring the soil by sampling over an extended period is useful for tracking responses to changes in management practices or long-term trends in soil fertility or limitations. There's a lot of interest in measuring soil carbon for carbon accounting and trading purposes. This type of soil sampling and analysis must be performed by a specifically trained and accredited practitioner and is not covered in this video. Nor does this video cover soil sampling appropriate for land survey. However, if you are interested in measuring and monitoring soil organic matter, which comprises of soil carbon and other essential nutrients such as nitrogen, phosphorus and sulphur, it can provide useful information on soil condition. Soil organic matter influences soil structure, nutrient retention and water holding capacity. You can request a soil organic matter measurement when you submit your soil sample if it is not included in the analysis package already. The timing of sampling is important. If you are using the data for fertiliser decisions, make sure you carry out sampling so that your test results are back in time. Sampling in early spring when the soils are not too hard can result in more consistent sampling to depth. However, some fertiliser decision making tools are often calibrated to summer sampling when the soil is dry and residual nutrients have migrated into the labile pools. If you are monitoring and your schedule is annual, then it's important to sample at approximately the same time each year and always record sample locations so that you can return to the same areas. A marker can be a flagging tape, a stake, GPS coordinates, or any method that works for you. Avoid sampling two to three months after applying any fertiliser or amendments, as that will influence the results. If you must sample in the two to three month window after fertilisation, you will need to account for the additional variability by collecting more, usually twice as many, individual subsamples across your paddock or zone. And try to wait 6 to 12 months after liming. Soil properties and fertility often vary, even over short distances. So to get an accurate and representative soil sample, at least 30 individual subsamples need to be collected across your paddock or zone. These subsamples are combined to make one composite sample. These subsamples must be thoroughly mixed in a clean bucket and then subsampled again to send to the lab for analysis. If you already have specific nutrient management zones mapped for your paddocks, or there is substantial variation in the landscape, or more than one soil type in your paddock, you should treat these as individual zones and analyse these separately. For this approach to be useful, you also need to fertilise and manage these different soil types separately. It is recommended that you collect your subsamples in a predefined pattern across the paddock or zone. This ensures your final sample is representative of the whole area. Sampling patterns include a transect, cluster, uniform grid, 
zigzag or randomised pattern. You can discover the pros and cons of each in the Fert Care Soil Sampling Guide at the link provided. For permanent row crops like orchards, these sampling patterns can be applied within rows. The location of previously banded fertiliser or fertigation lines should be considered in determining the row area. In some cases, between and within row areas may have to be sampled and tested separately. Each crop will have a different row area, which is often determined by the distribution of applied nutrients and the root systems. When sampling for fertiliser recommendations, refer to the Fert Care Soil Sampling Guide to determine the number of within row and between row cores you should collect to represent site fertility. The row area can grow over time with the crop development, such as in this avocado orchard. If you are soil testing to diagnose a problem, you can use a zoned sampling approach and collect sufficient cores within poor performing areas and compare them to your better performing areas. Simply limit your subsamples to the area of concern. In this case, it's useful to analyse a comparison sample from the same crop and soil type, but from a zone that is performing well, as this allows you to compare the results and more easily diagnose the problem. The depth of your soil sample is also important and will depend on your reason for sampling and the crop that is grown. If you are using soil test results to determine whether there are adequate plant nutrients available, then your results will be interpreted using a standardised fertiliser response curve. It's essential that the sampling depth you use matches that of the fertiliser response curve and crop type. Generally, pasture and cereal paddocks are sampled to 10 centimetres for nutrition programs. Check your industry standard before you start sampling, as different industries have different recommendations. Annual horticultural row crops, tree crops and vines are sampled to 15 centimetres. Some industries have standards to deeper layers, for example to 30 centimetres. Deep or subsurface sampling is useful when establishing a new crop or when you have deep-rooted crops such as trees, lucerne or wheat. Deeper sampling should also be considered when diagnosing a soil issue such as subsurface salinity, sodicity, alkalinity, acidity and some nutrient deficiencies. Recently, research has uncovered pronounced stratification in relation to soil properties, especially pH and phosphorus. Some farming practices such as reduced tillage or banding of fertiliser or amendments can result in thin layers with distinct properties down the soil profile. This stratification may affect plant growth, for example, when roots try and grow through an acidic soil layer. Prior to sampling, it is a good idea to carry out field soil pH tests in small increments, for example, five centimetres, to determine if this is an issue before you subsample for lab analyses. Soil pH can change with depth at several scales, with different soil types and different plant production systems. This example of a soil profile has nearly one pH unit change from the surface to 40 centimetres deep. No matter what sampling pattern and depth you use, there are certain spots you should normally avoid when taking soil samples, as the soil conditions are atypical and will bias the results. For example, a stock camp could be expected to have a higher concentration of nutrients than the rest of the paddock or zone. Other areas to avoid are headlands, tracks, watering points, manure patches, gateways, fence lines, old fertiliser or lime dumps and directly under drippers. Make a note of areas to avoid before you set out to collect samples. The goal when sampling is to take the same volume of soil from the same position in the soil profile every single time. This is most easily achieved with a soil corer or auger. Unless you are using a step corer, you will need to measure and mark the sample depth on your instrument. Equipment needs to be clean and dry before sampling. You will need a soil sampler, buckets and trowel, sample bags and a marker pen. 
You will also need a storage container, like an esky, to keep samples cool and away from sunlight. And it's essential if you are analysing available nitrogen or biological properties. Water is also useful to bring along to clean the equipment between sites. A large screwdriver can also be handy to help get soil out of the samplers if soil is sticky. When you're in the paddock, record the sampling location with GPS, the date, the field conditions and the sampling pattern you have decided to use. Have a look at your defined zone and note where you would subsample across the landscape, avoiding the sites that are not uniform or typical. In these examples, the zigzag pattern was chosen. In this row crop, the zigzag pattern is also used. However, the subsampling positions are located in the row area only, where fertiliser is regularly applied and where the roots would explore. OK, now it's time to collect the subsamples. In this video, there is a pasture and a tree crop example. The principles, however, apply to any crop, and this guide should help you take an accurate soil sample. Note the sampler is upslope of the trough and avoid sampling the area near the trough. For each subsample location, very carefully remove any surface litter, mulch or vegetation without disturbing the very top of the soil surface. Don't use your boot as you are likely to remove the most concentrated nutrient zone in the profile. Insert the corer to the set depth if you have a step corer or to the marked level if you have a tube corer. Remember to determine the sampling depth before you start. When you are using a soil auger, twist the auger into the soil to the pre-marked level for the depth you have decided. Carefully pull the auger up. You may want to twist the auger slightly as you remove it to ensure the entire sample is removed cleanly. You may need a screwdriver or pallet knife to remove the sample from the auger. Here in a macadamia orchard, a corer is used to take a subsample. The choice of what equipment to use depends on the soil type, soil moisture, root density and what you have available. This clay soil is not too wet so the sample can slide out of the corer quite easily. An auger is useful to collect samples at specific and deeper depths, but more care must be taken to extract the sample, ensuring the entire soil volume is collected. Collecting an intact sample with an auger can be especially difficult in dry, sandy soils. Place the entire soil subsample into your bucket and move to the next location. Each subsample needs to be complete. If some of the soil falls out before it makes it to the bucket, discard the whole sample. When you have finished subsampling, you must mix the soil together very thoroughly with the trowel. This is your composite sample. The lab usually needs around 500 grams of soil for analyses, depending on the types of analyses you require. Have your bags ready and clearly label them. If you are sending multiple samples for different zones, make sure you have recorded and identified which zone each composite sample was taken from. Transfer this amount into your pre-labeled sample bag and tape up or secure the bag so that no soil escapes. Place samples in an esky with frozen esky bricks if you can. Samples should be sent to the testing laboratory immediately using the lab's sample submission form. If this is not possible, store overnight in the refrigerator. Then it's time to relax and wait for the lab to send the results. Remember that not all laboratories use the same analysis methods, so submit your samples to the same lab if you want to compare results across years. Check that the analytes you are testing for are accredited by the Australian Soil and Plant Analysis Council, or ASPAC. A regular soil sampling strategy will give you cost-effective information to make important decisions on your nutrient status, soil condition and the long-term health of your farm.